testing, 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 testing. Josh Anthony, testing.
Hello, good evening. And thank you for coming to uh, Jimmy Panetta's town hall meeting today. Hello, my name is Jaime De La Cruz. I'm the San Manuel County Board of Supervisors Chairman. I, I really want to uh, talk about San Manuel County for a moment. Uh, San Manuel County is a beautiful community. We have the pinnacles, we have a lot of ag industry, we have a lot of business in our community, and we have a lot of concerns and a lot of good citizens in our community. And it's a good indication of today's meeting with the huge attendance. I really want to thank Jimmy Panetta for coming to this uh, town hall meeting today. Because Jimmy Panetta is a gentleman and a personal friend of mine. When he was out there campaigning, he was actually walking door to door and he came up to me and he asked me for my support. And the gentleman has not changed since the day we shake on the gentleman's agreement. Thank you, Jimmy, for coming to San Diego County. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy has, was elected in 2016 to represent Central Coast, and specifically San Benito County. And he's a gentleman, in fact, rumor has it that he used to walk the streets of San Benito County when he was a kid. Can't confirm that, but I heard those rumor. On that matter, I'd really like to introduce Jimmy Pineda to our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. Good evening, everybody. My name is Christina Chavez Wyatt. I'll be serving as our moderator for today. Um, I'm, a, I'm a proud resident of San Benito County, a small business owner, a wife of a farmer, a mom, um, a proud daughter of a veteran and a teacher. And I'm very happy to be the executive director of the San Benito County Business Council and working with the Economic Development Corporation of San Benito County on our countywide economic development strategy. So without further ado, I'd like to offer an opportunity to a young man who's been shattering uh, our Congress member. His name is Ian Sills, and he is gonna be doing our Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, if you could all rise and place your right hand over your heart and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And before we begin, just a few ground rules of how we're gonna be operating our town hall meeting today. Um, our meeting will run. We started uh, promptly at 6 p.m. We'll, we will conclude promptly at 7.30 p.m. So hopefully all of you will join me with your families and patronize some downtown businesses and have a dinner. Questions from tonight's town hall will be coming from the board chambers only. And we wanna get as many questions in as possible. And for this reasons, we ask that you keep your questions and comments to two minutes only. I will ask you to please raise your hand to be selected. And once you're selected to stand at the podium, we'll just have two people at a time. When you come to the podium, please state your first and last name and your city of residence. Um, we also have uh, the Congress member staff, Emmanuel and Karina, to assist. We are, we are utilizing the Board of Supervisors timing system, so you will see a countdown timer. And please wrap up your comments when the uh, red light signals so. Please make sure that you silence your cell phones, and if you need to take a call, please uh, step outside. If we don't get your question in tonight, please drop off your question in the Panetta drop box, drop box as you exit the room. Congress member Panetta will be live streaming tonight's town hall meeting via Facebook Live. Please feel free to share this information with your friends at Rep Jimmy Panetta and make sure that you like his page. We also are live streaming and being recorded from our partners at CMAP Community Media Access Partnership. And finally, I ask please use your utmost respect and decorum because we're a friendly community here in Hollister and please show your respect for all of us. Mr. Panetta, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me just take this time real quick to confirm that rumor that was me walking as this little seven-year-old uh, knocking on, probably knocking on your doors way back when. Uh, but it's, it is, uh, it's, it, I've developed fond memories of my time coming to San Benito, and I've come here throughout my life, uh, be it as a kid, uh, be it as a high school athlete at Carmel High that often got his butt kicked over here by the hay balers, 
and now uh, as a candidate and now as your Congress member. And it's always been great to uh, show up here and be a part of your community. And I appreciate the warm welcome that I have always received uh, when I come here, and I appreciate that. Uh, let me just take this time to uh, acknowledge and thank a few people. Obviously, Supervisor Jaime De La Cruz, thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction and uh, your friendship as well, and obviously your public service. Speaking of public service, someone who uh, grew up here and is a local boy, Supervisor Mark Medina, thank you very much. Also like to recognize Mayor Ignacio Velasquez, thank you as well for your service. Uh, Raymond Friend, Council Member, City of Hollister. Good, thank you. There he is. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Jim Gillio, Council Member, City of Hollister, in the back. Uh, Helen Felice, Condit, uh, Senator from Senator Anthony Canella's office. Oh, sorry, filling in, of course. Reed, Reed Hastings. <laughs> Reed, no, Reed, 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 thank you. And then Council Member, uh, of, of course, Mickey Luna uh, from the City of Hollister is here as well. Uh, Supervisor Jerry Munzer, thank you, Jerry, appreciate it. And uh, we have um, Dr. Parvian Sharma. Dr. Sharma? Oh, there she is. Good to see you again. And then we also have Julie uh, Vieira, Executive Director, CEO of San Benito County Chamber of Commerce. Mary Gilbert, Executive Director, Council San Benito County of Governments. Cesar Flores, President, San Benito County LULAC. Sherry Ann Stevenson, San Benito Veterans Service Office. Mike. Alcorn, Board of Directors, uh, Sunny Slope County Water District. And then Crystal Lamato, San Benito Superintendent of Schools. Great, great. Thank you all for coming. If there's someone I missed, I apologize. It's a list I got. Uh, but obviously, thank you for all of your public servants for what they do, not just for the city of Hollister, but what they do for the Central Coast of California. Uh, it is an absolute honor to be here tonight. Like I said, I'd, I would, I'd rather be here than Washington, D.C., especially this month, uh, considering, considering what's been going on. Uh, but it is, like I said, it's always great to be back in San Benito. Uh, this was the place where I came to not only as a kid, but also the first day after I was elected. I was here attending the Veterans Day ceremony and was honored to be a part of that. And I have continued to show up here throughout my, uh, my, throughout my congressional service, and I will continue to show up here uh, during the two years, this two-year term, and hopefully uh, beyond that. Um, but like I said, there are, there's a lot of issues uh, going on in Washington, D.C., as I think we've all felt. And you can only imagine what it's like to be a freshman member in Washington, D.C. at this point. And I can tell you, you're right, it's kind of nutty back there. But I can tell you the sense that I got from being back there is kind of not just the feeling that you're feeling, but the sense that I'm not alone. And that no matter who you talk to, be it someone who's been a freshman member or someone who's been there 40 years, which there are members who've been there 40 years, Republican, Democrat, in government, or out of government. They will all tell you the same thing, that this is unprecedented. They couldn't prepare for this, they didn't expect this, and they don't really have a grasp on how to handle this. But I believe that it is the proper time where Democrats and Republicans can actually work together to get things done. That the leadership Although it doesn't seem like it's coming from the top down, the leadership should then come from the bottom up. And I believe that it's our responsibility as your representative to make sure that we lead in that sense and that Democrats and Republicans work together. And in order to do that, we need to hear from you. And that's why this type of meeting, this type of town hall where we can hopefully have a good discussion, a fruitful discussion is so beneficial to me. I've said this often and I mean it. I was a prosecutor in my earlier career, 13 years up in Oakland, California, minus the year I was deployed to Afghanistan, and then six years five, uh, here in Monterey County, five years on the gang team in Monterey County. And I've always known that as a prosecutor, I cannot just stand up and yell, someone is guilty, and sit back down. That's not how you prove your case. In order to prove your case, you need evidence. And my evidence comes from you. And my evidence will come from what you say tonight. 
and so that I can be emboldened with that evidence when I go back to Washington, D.C. and continue my work on the Agriculture Committee, continue my work on the Armed Services Committee, and continue my work serving all of you here on the Central Coast of California, and especially right here in San Benito County. And so I want to thank you right out of the chute. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for providing me with the evidence that I can use in Washington, D.C. And thank you for allowing me this opportunity to hear you and to serve you. And I look forward to it. Thank you. One more, speaking of district attorneys, uh, Candace Hooper, uh, the uh, San Benito County District Attorney, uh, just showed up. Good evening. Thank you. Aren't we lucky to have him representing us in D.C. right now? Well, talk to me at 7.30. See how, see how they feel after this. So now we're going to start our question and answer session. So anyone who would like to start off the questions, if you wouldn't mind, please raising your hand, and we'll select some folks. Mr. Bryans and the young lady with the pink hair in the back, please come up to the podium. Again, two minutes for your questions, and then we'll give the Congress member a chance to answer. Yes, Congressman, um, and I won't talk about agriculture as I did at the, uh, the meeting a week ago, uh, but what I, I do want to say is that we do need to take care of all of our people here in the community, including especially the farm workers, and so I do want to make sure and, and say that. Um, tonight I'd like to speak about several things that I believe are prime opportunities for bipartisan activity. Uh, the first one is sentencing reform and crime recidivism protection, uh, prevention. Um, oftentimes, we, as I know you saw in your job, we have mental health issues that play into why people are in crime situations. We have uh, economic issues that we should have better opportunities to work with people, not in the sense of supporting people with more money, but actually having better uh, job connection and things like that. Um, I'm hoping that that's something that will get back on track from where things seemed to be going uh, a year ago in Washington. Um, also, I wanted to make sure and say that uh, having met with Sam Farr many a time in Washington and actually seen him working with people in the Senate, people on the other side of the aisle, people on the same side of the aisle, that uh, he had an amazing ability to not only work with people of all different backgrounds, but also to develop those relationships. And I am praying that he was able to uh, give you lots of entrees in that regard, because there are good people on both sides of the aisle. Um, I saw that in doing lobbying on ag issues. Uh, actually, I'm a Democrat, but I intentionally met with a number of staffs of Republican congressmen, because you need to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could, in the future, for future people who are asking questions, if you just uh, tell me your name and what part of the county or what part of the Central Coast or what part of California you're from. I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, look, in regards to sentencing reform, I, look, I think you you hit something that is very, very important in the sense that. Let me just kind of digress real quick. I, as a prosecutor, especially on the gang team, um, I dealt with very uh, people who would commit very malevolent acts. And for five years, I was dealing with some very heinous, some very horrific crimes on the gang team. And doing my job as a prosecutor, uh, proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt in, in a court of law, and uh, basically ensuring that there was responsibility taken for the crimes that were committed. I got off the gang team and I got on to general felonies. And it was a time where I remember sitting there at the table and you would see them come, a defendant come in from the back halls, come into the jury box where they were for the pretrial sentencing, and you could look at him or her and you would have the sense that there was a mental health issue. And then I would read the police report and I would see that clearly this person was here for a mental health issue, 
uh, something to the extent of taking a shopping cart and hitting it into a side of a vehicle for no reason. Damage was over the uh, amount to be a felony. Therefore, he's charged with a felony vandalism, and this person was right here. Now, because it was sort of a low-level felony, this person would end up doing a limited amount of time and be right back on the streets. And it was a revolving door. And it made me realize that clearly mental health has to be an aspect. Ideally, it'd be great if it could be part of our criminal justice system. But because of AB 109, because of Prop 47 state initiatives, we cannot rely on the criminal justice system to provide those services. So where does it fall on? It falls on the county. It falls on the city. And we're dealing with those issues now, and I think that's part of the reason why you're seeing an uptick in homelessness uh, in certain areas. And it's unfortunate, but I do believe that you're spot on in the sense that we have to get back to providing those types of services either before they get into custody, definitely post-release custody. There needs to be some sort of services, and ideally what you'd like, look, the state did a great job with Prop 63, the Mental Health Services Act, it is. And, and also then just last year, they took a certain percentage of the MHSA and put it into housing for people with mental health issues. The state has done a good job. The counties are trying to keep up uh, in providing funding for those types of services. At least I saw it in Monterey County. But I believe that it is time for the federal government to step up. I'm so glad that the ACA provided, made sure that mental health services, mental health care was covered under the ACA. And that's something that I'll continue to fight for and why I fought against the complete repeal of the ACA. But I also believe that it's time for the federal government to step up and provide more uh, either research, more funding for services, more types of grants so that our local agencies, our local organizations can have the funding necessary to treat people in that situation. I firmly believe that. In regards to bipartisanship, and obviously the excellent work that Congressman Sam Farr did uh, in order to make sure that uh, people got taken care of in this community. Uh, Sam was there long enough to develop these relationships on both sides of the aisle. Sam was there long enough to get appointed to the Appropriations Committee in order to make sure that the, uh, there were the proper appropriations for the Central Coast of California. But it takes time to be there. And it takes time to develop these types of relationships in order to get there. I can tell you right now that's exactly, exactly what I am doing in my job. Because I am not only making friends with Democratic members, which is easy, I am making friends with Republican members. And let me tell you, there is a sense amongst the younger congressional members that we have heard you. And let me, let me just tell a quick story. When we first got back to Washington, D.C., new member orientation, the week after the election, we get back to Washington, D.C., we get there automatically. Leadership of both parties puts the Democrats on one side and the Republicans on the other. They automatically separate us. It wasn't until the third week where we left Washington, got up to Boston, we were at doing a symposium up at Harvard for the new members, and Democrats and Republicans started to talk with one another. And we started to like one another. And we started to hear about why they came to Congress. And it got to a point where we, had, we kicked leadership out of the room. We kicked them out of the room because we wanted to have a frank discussion. And I can tell you those conversations are one I'll never, ones I'll never forget. Because I heard from the Republicans what I've heard from you throughout the campaign, what I've continued to hear from all of you. And that is, it's time for us to get to Washington, D.C., get things done, and do it together. And I can tell you that there are a younger generation of congressional members on both sides of the aisle that that's exactly why they're there. And that, as my good friend Drew Ferguson told me, Drew, Drew Ferguson is a, a very conservative Congress member from Georgia. And so conservative that, you know, I, I, he voted against the budget a few months ago. And it's a Republican budget. And so I wanted to figure out why this Republican voted against a Republican budget. So I went down on the House floor and I saw him and said, Drew, why'd you vote against that budget? And he looked at me and he said, Jimmy, in my district, indivisible doesn't show up at my town halls. The Tea Party does. And that's why he voted against it. But then he also said, Jimmy, let me tell you, we're going to get through this silly season and be able to get things done. 
And I firmly believe that. And I'm not, look, I, you have to be optimistic to be in this job, but I can tell you it's more than just being optimistic. I'm not only hearing it, I'm feeling it that people want to get things done and we're going to do it together. Thank you, Congressmember. Sir, if you want to line up to be next, it would be great for the next question. I'm sorry. Turn it on. <laughs> My name's Linda George. I live in Hollister here. And um, as a segue to what you were talking about, the homelessness, I've been, I actually started living here homeless um, when I moved to Hollister. And as the years, uh, we are, I'm now a permanent resident, but with the homelessness, there was very little services for myself. And um, my question is, how with the housing crisis that I believe is statewide, I'm on Rebecca Kaplan's soapbox about the, the housing being statewide and an issue. One of the things is that I'm understanding that this county is not meeting its growth factor or measure. How can you help this along with helping Caltrans to widen the roads and to accommodate people like me? I had to resign from my 30-year job from the state because apartments went from 2,600 to 3,400, an average two-bedroom apartment. Um, fortunately, I had a, a backup, but my question is, how can we get the assembly, Assembly Caballero, how can we get Senator Canella to get the needs met for maybe the monies out of SB1 from Senator Bell, whatever it takes to get a c communication going because there's no 24 seven hour services, which is something that's always bothered me. If my child gets sick, there's no safe way open to go get Pedialyte. There's a hospital. Walmart has now closed its 24 seven services. So this community has to drive an average of 15 miles if they have something less than an urgent matter. So that's my basic question is how can we get uh, more oversight into the, uh, into the homeless factor, into the growth, and then the fight that's happening inside the city about the 400 block. Um, my understanding, if the state wants us to grow in anywhere we live, we gotta grow. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for your 30 years of service uh, in state government. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And today you retired from last week. Congrat congratulations, <laughs> congratulations. Um, I, I, I you asked a, a number of questions, and I've tried taking notes, uh, but I think uh, you know I'll start off with the ones that I got down, and that's obviously with homelessness. Um, you know, that's that's it, I believe, and I've said this all along, as I said throughout my candidacy, uh, that's not just a local issue, it's not just a state issue, and it is a federal issue too. Um, I do believe that, and and I can speak from the federal side of things. Uh, I do believe that there needs to be grants given to local organizations in order to uh, help them uh, provide those services necessary, as I talked about in my last answer. Um, obviously, in this delicate and difficult time uh, of spending cuts, and I should say proposed spending cuts at this point, um, those types of services that are on the chopping block. But it's up to us to hear from you so that we can continue to fight for those types of grants when they come down to this level. In regards to the housing, I mean, you're dealing with an issue. This is an issue that I not just hear in San Benito County, I hear in Santa Cruz County, I hear in Monterey County, where the average price of a house in Monterey County is, what, close to 600000 The average price of a house in Santa Cruz County is over 800000 um, You know, I, I, it, it, and, and the average income is, what, about 60000 that means that there is a third of a, a number of people paying close to a third of their income going to their housing cost. I mean, that that's, qualifies as Section 8. And that's an issue. And we are fortunate enough to have organizations like the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And I was proud to take part in a press conference in which they announced the Monterey uh, Bay Economic Partnership Housing Trust. A housing trust. Now what a housing trust is, is that if you look at the Silicon Valley Housing Trust, that's a housing trust where people have given to it, organizations have given to it, governments have given to it, 
to provide basically money that developers can take money out of in order to uh, provide low-income housing, other forms of housing, mixed-use housing, things like that. And Monterey Bay has started that. Uh, thanks to the work of Bud Colligan and uh, his vision when it comes to the three, the tri-counties in this area, San Benito County being one of them, that will be able to qualify, uh, developers will be able to qualify for those loans from that housing trust. Now, it's not as big as Silicon Valley Housing Trust, but it's a start, and it's something that I believe will actually uh, affect uh, will actually affect this area once we uh, be able to provide develop developers with those grants. There also needs to be more tax credits, the 4% and the 9% tax credits for developers so that they can uh, be able to develop low-income housing, uh, medium-income housing, uh, mixed-use housing, uh, and get the appropriate tax credits in order to do that. Um, it, it's, look, it, in this area, this is a big issue, and it affects all walks of life. I mean, I think we are all proud that we are from here. I am proud that I was able to come back with my wife, who also works full time, and buy a house. But it wasn't easy. I want my daughters, my two daughters, who are now 10 and 12, and soon enough they're going to be gone in college. I want them to go away, but I want them to come back. I want them to come back home. And it is an issue that I want to help them be able to do that. And I think all of us want our children to come back home, live here, and raise families here. And that's something that's on my radar and something that I'll do everything I can in Washington, D.C. to make sure that our housing problem here on the Central Coast is alleviated. I would like to uh, engage all of you in a local conversation that we have on, a, on a, a county level. We actually have subcommittees working on affordable housing and on with the development of the Homeless Service Center and providing services here in San Benito County and the city of Hollister. So please contact the county uh, Health and Human Services if you'd like to get engaged or um, contact me after. I'd be happy to give you my card and ask so you could be on the, the contact list. And regard uh, Senate Bill 1 and infrastructure funding and our local roadway funding please talk to Mary Gilbert at our, our uh, Council of Governments. Uh, unfortunately, we're only getting about $600,000 for SB1 for the first year, which really doesn't go very far. So one of our top level uh, goals here locally, we have to create jobs. If we have people here working locally and having a good income, that really helps us with a lot of our infrastructure services, give people more time with their family to be able to volunteer and engage in our community. Sir? All right, my name is Mark Schroeder, and uh, I am a resident in uh, Mark Bedina's first district. And I would like to thank him for all of his work, uh, in addition to Kevin O'Neill, during the devastation of four atmospheric river events that occurred in my area on Lover's Lane. And uh, Lover's Lane is now virtually infamous. <laughs> um, it may not sound like it, but uh, it turns out that uh, definitely we did have a river coming down the road, and the remarkable devastation uh, has caused so many of the residents uh, to evacuate and leave and never come back. And they're basically leaving their houses and, and just writing them off. And uh, Congressman, you mentioned when we were talking earlier about flood insurance, that is a major issue for a lot of people. However, uh, I was one of the least hard hit. And, but I advocated for a lot of people and helped a lot of people. And I'm not sitting here blowing my horn about it. But um, one of the things that I'm here for is the primary cause of the problem was or is that the creek, Pacheco Creek, the waterways, I'm talking infrastructure, which is one thing that I was referring to. The creek has not been cleared in 20 years, and they cannot get a permit from the Fish and Game Department for whatever reason because of so-called environmental concerns that are unclear. Um, so we need to deal with that. And with the 10 seconds that I have left, I, I am an entrepreneur. I'd like to talk to you afterwards because uh, Supervisor Medina and I have talked about me creating a business here in San Benito County. And I have funding. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, you know, I, I had the fortunate opportunity to uh, 
go out to that scene and see the unfortunate devastation uh, that was out there uh, in the, its immediate aftermath. I actually think that was one of the first weekends uh, on the, when I came home. Uh, I think it was one of the, the first weekend I came home, early January, correct? In January? Exactly. Yeah. So it was the first weekend I was out there, thanks to Mark and, and, and thanks to the great work of Supervisor Medina, as well as Kevin O'Neill. Uh, they, they, they were on it and we were in constant contact with them. Both Mark and Kevin had my cell phones and they had my staff cell phones and we were in constant contact during those weeks. And um, we, fortunately, the fact that I was able to get out there, see the devastation, allowed me and my staff to report back to FEMA and make sure that FEMA was uh, able to provide the proper funding so that the repairs can be done. Uh, and, and that's, you know, and I, and I hope that has been done. I hope it will continue to be done. Now, in regards to the river clearing, the only, the only analogy I can use is what took place in the Salinas Valley, with the Salinas Valley River, if you heard about this, where there were some uh, lawsuits about the clearing of the river. The Otter Project, I think it was, basically uh, sued some of the agricultural uh, landowners in that area and prevented them from going in there and cleaning it out like they used to. But I can tell you the bright light to this was that a number of agencies, as long as it took, but a number of agencies did come together, including Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife, and they actually came up with a solution in regards to clearing that river. And they basically piecemealed it. I'm not saying it's ideal, okay? It's, and it's definitely not as easy as just taking a, you know, a backhoe and going in there and clearing it out. But there are certain environmental concerns and certain environmental regulations that we have to watch out for. But when you get everybody to the table, like with most things, when you bring them to the table, it takes time, it takes a lot of hard work, but you bring them to the table and you can obviously try to come up with a solution in order to get to that clearing. Uh, and so that's what I would recommend and I'd be happy to facilitate that uh, if necessary. Of course. Yeah, no, definitely. We'll continue to have that conversation. Please, definitely. Thank you, Mark. So our jurisdiction is also participating what's called the Central Coast Climate Collective, and we've received a grant to work with the EPA and FEMA and host a workshop hopefully in the next quarter, um, working in cooperation with Kevin O'Neill to bring in all the jurisdictions, the federal agencies, Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so we can help to put our emergency action plan into place, fix our infrastructure, but also get through those regulatory and bureaucratic hurdles that are keeping us from getting the work done. I get it. I understand. And, and, that's, and that's the issue right there is whether or not they're allowed based on the regulations that pertain to that section of, uh, of Lover's Lane and the, and the river that goes through there. Thank you, Mark. Hi, uh, my name is James Parker. I'm here with my wife today. The question I have for you is we have a son who's in the Army. Uh, He's just started in the Army. He's going to report to his duty station early next year, and my feeling is he will deploy shortly after that. The question that I have is, as a parent, and with you being on the Armed Services Committee, what kind of word do you have for parents in that situation that can help us know that he's got the resources available and he's, he's going to be uh, okay? So. First of all, obviously, thank you uh, and your wife and your son uh, for the service that they're providing. I appreciate that. Um, as you know, the, the words that I offer you, and it's not necessarily based on my current role on the armed services, it's as my former role as an officer uh, in the Navy that deployed and served in Afghanistan. And I can tell you that uh, you know, your son is going to be surrounded by uh, a number of young men and young women uh, who are there uh, for the same reasons that uh, your, your, your son signed up for, and that's to serve and to give back. 
And I, it was one of my, one of the highlights of my life was my service abroad. Uh, you know, I look at my time abroad as kind of uh, like having children. I forget the bad stuff and I just think of the good things. Uh, seriously, uh, don't we, I don't try, I try, you know, talk about it too much and then I start remembering uh, some of the bad things. But the fact is, is that I, I think of it as a time in my life where I was able to serve and able to serve with people like uh, Brendan Looney, uh, a gentleman who uh, uh, died, he was a Navy SEAL who died uh, in Afghanistan, and it was uh, his brethren in arms who he went to the uh, Naval Academy with. And on, and I visited uh, area, uh, area 60, and I went to his tombstone, and part of, you know, what it said on the tombstone was, if not me, then who? If not me, then who? And it's that attitude that I think is in all of the young men and women that serve. And that's why, as a member of the armed services, I am so fortunate. I am so fortunate that I know, have confidence that there's young men out there, like your son, who is serving, who took the, the, that step forward. And that's what people got to realize. There are young men, like your son, that they don't take steps back. They run forward. That's been this generation. This generation who have served in, since 2001 is that generation that ran forward. They ran forward because they felt that sense. Less than 1% of our nation serves in the armed services. There's an issue, I heard this the other day from a U.S. Senator that talked about how many of us don't know veterans. Many of us don't know people who have served because it's shrinking. And that's why you should be so proud that of not just of your son, but the fact is that there's, he's going to be surrounded by young men and women with that attitude. And to me, that's what our nation's about. Um, there was a quote that I saw that I, I firmly believe in, and it, and it was by John F. Kennedy. And it goes something like this that I think demonstrates uh, probably the, 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 the intentions of your son. It says, in the long history, in the long history of our world, very few generations are granted, are granted the opportunity to defend freedom at its maximum hour of danger. I do not shrink from that responsibility. I welcome it. And to me, that quote defines your son. And that's what you should be proud of. Because I feel in my responsibility as a Congress member on the Armed Services Committee, it is, it is my responsibility to provide the men and women with the necessary tools to protect and to fight and to serve. And I can tell you that we are aware that right now our military is shrinking, okay? It's, one, it's at the smallest it's been in a long time. And it needs to have proper investment. You talk to uh, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, you talk to the generals uh, who come and testify in front of the Armed Services, all of them will tell you we have to stop coming up with these continuing resolutions in our budget, and we need to pass a budget so we can invest in our military, invest in our future. That budget is coming up in September, and it's, we have 12 working days to pass that budget. And it's going to be difficult to do it, but with the motivation that I have knowing that your son is serving, I will do everything I can to make sure that not only is a budget passed, but that it provides the necessary tools for your son to be safe and help do his job in protecting us. Hello, Congressman Panetta. My name is Emiliano Sparza, and I'm from the city of San Juan Batista. I'm the vice chair of the Youth Commission there, and we have made it our duty to educate the youth, especially the migrant youth, about the dangers to them and their future posed by climate change. And we feel upon working with the youth and talking to them, we've, re we've realized that with actions taken by the administration and by, politi by politicians right now, such as withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords, that many youth at this time have withdrawn themselves to a more cynical view of the of the issue thinking that people who frankly will not be alive when the lion's share of the most damaging effects comes to pass that we will have to deal with that we are worried and we know that there's something that must be done and my question for you is 
in your position of power that you have, what is it that you think you can do or work with people across the aisle and people in your own party to help solve these issues to keep these from affecting us down the road and causing innumerable damage? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I, look, I, I, I believe climate change is, is real. Uh, I believe it is happening, and that's why I believe that we do need to take appropriate steps to address that issue. Um, when it comes to this administration, as we've seen, um, this administration stepped back from that treaty, as you mentioned. And the, I, I think that was the wrong decision for a number of reasons. One, because I think it's our responsibility to be a part of that. But I have to say, more importantly, I believe that it hurts the credibility of the United States when you enter into an agreement and then pull back out of it. And that was the big problem with that. And that was, um, I believe, something that was a, was a mistake. And that leads me to believe that leadership on climate change is not going to come from the top down during this administration. It's going to come from the bottom up from people like you, from people like my daughters who are always telling me what to do when it comes to my trash and my refuse and where to put it, what they're learning in school, but also from the, as we've seen, the steps that the state of California has taken, but also a number of young Congress members who have actually got together in the Climate Solutions Caucus in Washington, D.C. Now, the Climate Solutions Caucus is a purely bipartisan caucus. And what I mean by that is in order to join, you have to have, a, if, as a Democrat, if I wanted to join, I needed to bring a Republican with me. So there's the same amount of Democrats as the same amount of Republicans, and I think it's a great thing. But I admit, as a Democrat, it was a little difficult for me to get a Republican. I, the first, the first uh, uh, gentleman I contacted, a Republican from Florida, I said, um, I said, hey, you know, he was a freshman member. I said, you're from the Jacksonville area. I know there could be threats of sea level rise based on climate change. How would you like to join the Climate Solution Caucus and at least have a conversation about it? And he said, yeah, yeah, no, that sounds good. That sounds good. Have your staff contact my staff. Okay. So I had my staff contact his staff. Didn't hear anything. Again, staff reached out. Didn't hear anything. Third time, reached out. Didn't hear anything. Finally, the fourth time, reached out. His staff said, oh, the Congress member's not ready to join the Climate Solutions Caucus. Okay, so I thought about it some more. And Scott Taylor is a Republican congressman, former Navy SEAL, from Norfolk, Virginia. And I knew that Norfolk has some dry day flooding. They are dealing with rising sea levels. And I also know that Norfolk is a place of a uh, major Navy base there. So it's not just a local issue, it's a national security issue. And I talked to him. And he said, yeah, yeah, have your staff contact my staff. So I did one time. Staff contacted him, didn't hear back. And then I told my staff, stop, let me deal with it. Literally, I was on the House of the Floor of Representatives. I went across the aisle. I found him. I sat down next to him. I talked to him. And Scott and I are now on the Climate Solutions Caucus. And we have actually been talking about these issues. I'm not saying anything grand is going to come out, out of it. But the fact that we have both sides of uh, Democrats and Republicans, mostly young members, at the table talking about climate change, talking about possible solutions to do it, talking about renewable energy uh, and the resources, especially being proud from California, number one in solar, number one in wind, uh, uh, number, no, excuse me, number one in solar, number two in wind behind Texas, number one in geothermal, uh, and what, we've, what Jerry Brown and the state legislature has been doing, uh, it, it makes me proud. I and mean, also hearing from people like you, and, and that's where it's going to come from. Like I said, when we lead from climate in, the, in regards to climate change and addressing those solutions, it's going to be bottom up, and we just got to continue to do it. And I appreciate uh, that question. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to participate on the Mon Monterey Bay Climate Action Compact. We're a tri county organization working on climate issues. Are you familiar with the organization? Great. Yeah, please. And then you got the, the, clean, uh, the clean power plans, the local plans, uh, where a number of counties are agreeing to basically use a per certain percentage uh, from renewables. That's another thing. Once again, it's bottom up. So we have uh, two representatives on Monterey Bay Community Power from our region, which is the city of Hollister, Council Member Friend. Um, he's retired from PG&E. He knows the industry very well. And then also our Board of Supervisors Chairman, Jaime De La Cruz. 
Hi, my name is Nancy Plesic and I live here in Hollister. My husband, Frank, is a vet and served his military like he should. Um, he went into the military, he was not drafted, he volunteered. My, my questions are regarding how we're taking care of our vets. We have to understand that vets don't just wake up one day and they have PTSD or they're, they're disabled in some way. They have nightmares, they have, they're exposed to Agent Orange. In order for you, and it's how the system works, but I, I really um, challenge all of you to go on to your computer, go on the website, and look at the VA website and try to navigate it. I'm not stupid, and I worked in, <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've worked in, with computers for most of my life. And we've never had such arguments trying to get to the right spot. The other thing is, we need to have doctors, especially psychiatrists and psychologists that have been in the military. My husband's been seeing this one guy at Marina, nice guy, I've been a couple of times. And I looked at him and I said, did you serve? No. How do you know about PTSD? You don't have to have gone to Vietnam or, or Iraq or Iran. They can have it, it's, it's just, it mind boggles me. Just, in order for you to submit a claim, it has to be easier. He has to show his written orders as to when he went from this school to that base and everything else. Thank God 